I invite, you, I invite you to hear the words of St. Mark's Passion. And Peter called to mind the word that Jesus said unto him, Before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And when he thought thereon, he wept. The character of Peter in the Gospels is an incredibly complex character. In so many ways, he is the ideal follower of Christ. He's bold, he's courageous, he's not afraid to say what's on his mind, he's not afraid to go where Christ would lead him to go. He is an incredible disciple. And yet we also know from the Passion narratives, we know that Peter also fell down. That Peter, in his own way, failed himself. We see that very clearly in the portion of Scripture to be read on the Monday of Holy Week, in the first part of Mark's Passion narrative. We see that so strongly in the character of this Peter, who, when Jesus speaks of the way in which all the disciples will fall away from him, that they all run away. It's Peter who says very boldly, no, no, if these guys all run away, I will not run away. I will stay with you. In fact, I'll be ready to actually die with you. In a way, I think Peter was genuinely honest. I don't think Peter was trying to fool anybody, least of all himself, in that bold statement. I think in that particular moment, he was utterly convinced that's exactly what he was willing to do. And in fact, we perhaps see a hint of that in the garden scene when they come to arrest Jesus, because... As we are told, it is Peter who has the sword. It is Peter who cuts off the ear of the servant of the high priest. It's Peter who, in that context, is not afraid to go into battle to do what he thinks he needs to do to rescue Christ. So in many ways, Peter was utterly true to his word. But we also know that later on, after the heat of that particular moment, when there's more time to stand and sit and reflect when he's warming himself before the charcoal fire, we also know in that moment that perhaps doubt begins to creep in. Perhaps fear begins to creep into his heart. So that when he is challenged, when someone suggests that he's a follower of Jesus, he denies it, not once, not twice, or three times. Peter knows that he has failed Christ. He knows that he has failed to do what he said he would do. So he has failed Christ, but above all, he has, in a way, failed himself. And that might have been, in a way, the end of the story for Peter. Maybe sometimes that's the end of the story for us. Maybe we have those moments when we feel that we have failed others. So those moments when we have done something or said something or not done what we should have done or not said what we should have said. And we live with the guilt of that for a long time afterwards, perhaps so much so that we can no longer face that person, we can no longer engage that person or be in relationship with that person. No matter who we are, we all have those moments, those times when we fail others and perhaps when we fail ourselves. But the story of Peter doesn't end there. The story of Peter continues on, and there is a remarkable scene that I'm sure you're familiar with that takes place up in Galilee after the resurrection. A scene where Peter and Jesus have a private conversation after they've just had breakfast on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus asked, asked Peter in that moment, Simon Peter, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? In a way, the exact same thing that Peter had been boldly willing to claim just a short time before. Even though these all fall away, I will not fall away, Peter says. I will not fail you. So do you love me more than the rest of these? Simon Peter, Jesus asks. And Peter says a strange thing. In the text, in the text, when Jesus asks Simon Peter, do you love me? The Greek word agape is used. It's that complete self-giving kind of love. The, the, the word that we use when we speak about God's love for us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Agape love is that complete self-giving love. And that was the kind of love that Peter had claimed earlier on. He was willing to die for Jesus. He was willing to give himself up completely for Jesus. And that's what Jesus asked him. Do you agape? Do you agape me? Do you love me fully and completely? Do you love me fully and completely more than all these others do? 
But when Peter answers that question, he says yes. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you, is how it comes to us in the translation. So it sounds like he's saying yes, but in reality he's saying no. Because when Peter answers that question, he doesn't use the word agape for love. He uses the word phileo, another word, a Greek word for love. It speaks of a friendship kind of love, not that complete self-giving love that we hear that we that we hear about God for us. Not that complete self-giving love, but a lesser kind of love. An important love nonetheless, but a lesser kind of love. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you as a friend. Peter knows he can no longer make that bold claim. So Jesus asks the second question. Simon Peter, do you agape me? No longer does Simon, no longer is Simon being asked whether or not he loves Jesus more than anybody else. Just do you love me? Do you love me in that complete self-giving kind of way? So Jesus has, in a sense, lowered the bar. He's not holding Simon Peter to the very same standard that he, Simon Peter was prepared to claim not so long before. Do you love me fully, completely? Do you have that self-giving love for me? And Simon Peter answers, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. You know that I love you as a friend. So again, Simon Peter knows, his, he knows himself better than he knew himself before. He knows his limits. He can't make that claim that to love Jesus fully and completely with that complete sense of self-giving, he can only claim to love Jesus as a friend. So finally, Jesus lowers the bar one more time. Simon Peter, do you love me? Do you phileo me? Jesus finally brings the question down to that level where Simon Peter can answer honestly, yes. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you as a friend. Perhaps you have memories of failing others. Perhaps you have memories of failing yourself. Perhaps you live with that sense of guilt, that sense of loss, that sense of disappointment in yourself. And perhaps because of that, you find it difficult to engage those relationships. Remember what Jesus does for Simon Peter. He is prepared to meet Simon Peter where he is. And in that place where Simon can honestly say yes, even though it's not where Simon thought he was going to be, and not, not where he thought he deserved to be, in that place where Simon can honestly answer yes, Jesus is prepared to take that and to go with it. To take that and to run with it. And to take Simon Peter and to call Simon Peter to be a shepherd of the sheep, to feed the flock. Whatever disappointments you may have in yourself, whatever sadnesses may reside in your heart, whatever failures you may be living with of recent memory or of long memory, remember this, that Jesus comes to meet you where your love is right now. He's not asking your love to be perfect love. He's only asking you to walk with him, to start where you are. And if you start where you are to walk with Christ on that road to healing, on that road to peace and reconciliation, you may be surprised where your love goes. It may be far greater than you imagine possible. But like Simon Peter, you have to get up from your failures. You have to get up from your disappointments and you have to walk with Christ. On this Monday in Holy Week, let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who of thy tender love towards mankind has sent thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to take upon him our flesh and to suffer death upon the cross, that all mankind should follow the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may both follow the example of his patience and also be made partakers of his resurrection. Through the same, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.